Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Jan Hans Kutzer, and I represent the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And I have the great honor and pleasure to moderate this, the second webinar um, on behalf of the World Humanitarian Forum. The World Humanitarian Forum is the largest and most inclusive nonpartisan forum in humanitarian aid and international development. WHF brings together decision makers, opinion formers in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, as well as the next generation of partnership builders and thought leaders. The annual events advances critical global discussions and transform general conversations into action as well as providing a powerful forum to catalyze collaboration through shared valued approaches and social impact objectives. WHF is an international knowledge exchange platform at the intersection of government, aid, development and innovation aimed to improve the lives of the millions in need. Allow me just a couple of seconds to um, set the framework of our second webinar. It is entitled Education in Emergencies. Almost five years into the 15 year commitment towards the global goals, the United Nations estimates that over 265 million children are still out of school. While major progress has been made in the last 10 years, there is still an important disparity around the globe. Questions of access to education, issues surrounding the lack of trained teachers, poor conditions of schools, and a lack of educational provision in rural communities need to be improved. Not to mention the lack of equal opportunity of education between regions and gender. The year 2020 brought a whole new hurdle. The COVID-19 pandemic has halted many education systems around the world, forcing governments to create immediate solutions to stump greater consequences to the education of millions of people. The impact on education during this pandemic is hard for us to fathom or even to measure. Our goal is therefore to use this hour together to address these hard questions, to open lines of dialogue between change makers, world influencers, and civil society, so that we can discuss the way forward. Is it both inclusive and pertinent? As we try to move our agenda forward and shaping the future for a better tomorrow, we are striving to begin this conversation that can lead to real transformative change. And this is where I, it's my deep honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished panel. I would like to introduce the Right Honorable Douglas Alexander. He is the chair of UNICEF UK. He is also senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and a visiting professor at King's College London, a trustee of the Royal United Services Institute and a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Alexander served in the UK government for nine years. Uh, he has also served as a senior advisor to the RISE Fund, uh, a new two billion global impact fund, and to you two frontman Bono, advising on investment and development on Africa. Um, I would like now to introduce Yasmin Sharif. She's the director of Education Cannot Wait, a global fund for education in emergencies and protracted crisis. A lawyer by education, but a humanitarian and experience and a thought leader in implementing policy to action. She brings 30 years of experience of working with UNHCR, UNDP and OCHA and various international NGOs. Our final panelist, Noella Kusaris Musanka, 
she is the CEO and founder of Malaika, a grassroots nonprofit that both educate and empower girls and communities in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Noella was named one of the BBC's 100 most influential and inspirational women of the year 2018. Congratulations and well done on that massive achievement, Noella. She also received an achievement award at the 100 year Mandela celebration. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, you are in the hands of a really um, uh, group of experts that um, not only is going to talk about policy and experiences, but they're also going to bring that very human perspective <clears throat> because we are talking not just in terms of policy, but also to bring it down, how do you translate it into concrete action that will create those um, networks for implementation in the community. So without any further ado, I invite the Right Honourable Douglas Alexander to give us his opening statements. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for that very kind introduction and for moderating what I believe is a really timely and important discussion today. And at the outset, I'd obviously also want to express my gratitude to the World Humanitarian Forum for bringing us together, albeit virtually, in these unprecedented and challenging times. Uh, the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic on education is a vital subject. It's also great and a pleasure uh, to be sharing a platform both with Yasmin and Noella. I am great admirers of both of their work. Now, as we know, COVID-19 is a virus which medically hits the elderly hardest. But we are also learning that the necessary responses to the pandemic are hitting young people very hard indeed. It's estimated that 1.3 billion children around the world have now been furloughed out of education. So this pandemic has also resulted in an acute education emergency with the added risk of chronic longer term consequences. Indeed, there's a real risk that unless we act urgently, education will be put permanently out of reach for many children in the poorest parts of the world. Let's be clear, even before this terrible pandemic, we were facing a learning crisis globally. UNICEF estimates that due to the lack of trained teachers, inadequate learning materials, makeshift classes, poverty, hunger, and poor sanitation, fully 617 million children and adolescents around the world were previously unable to reach minimum proficiency levels in reading and in mathematics, even though two thirds of them were actually in school before this pandemic. With a total of 165 countries now having implemented nationwide school closures and several others, including the United States and Russia, having localized school closures, we're now estimating that 90% of students, that's 1.52 billion young people, have had their education impacted as a result of COVID-19. And of course, when children are unable to learn and go to school, it's not just books and teachers and lessons that they leave behind. They're also leaving behind a vital channel of getting risk information to them and into the wider community. They're leaving behind vital access to school feeding programs and a place where an example can be set of good hygiene practices and where facilities are provided, for example, for clean water and sanitation. When over 37% of the population does not have access to safe water at home, for many children, school is where they access clean water, hand washing and toilet facilities. UNICEF's work in more than 190 countries around the world and that work experience over many decades confirms that schools are vital to children's welfare as well as to children's education. School provides a structure through which risk to children's safety and well-being can be spotted early and reported when necessary. This is especially true for girls. And we know that without that safety net of the school, there is an increased risk right now of exploitation and exclusion, including trafficking, sexual violence, early marriage, and forced labor. 
if we take the example of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa between 2014 and 2016, a study by the United Nations Development Programme found that in Sierra Leone, teenage pregnancy increased by fully 65% as a result of the socioeconomic conditions imposed during the outbreak. And for the 75 million children and youth whose education was already disrupted due to armed conflict, food displacement, climate change induced disasters and other crises, this pandemic has placed them in a state of double jeopardy. So how, as UNICEF, are we responding to this quite unprecedented education emergency? There is certainly more than enough work to go around. So we are working with other agencies in a cluster approach designated by the UN Interagency Standing Committee. We are co-leading the education cluster with our good friends in Save the Children, and over 154 million children in 80 countries are currently being supported with home and distance-based learning. Our response begins with an understanding that this pandemic could turn into a child's rights crisis if the needs and vulnerabilities of children are not considered at an early stage of response planning and indeed delivery. Globally, we're sustaining and expanding our business as usual operations to ensure that school environments have safe and sufficient hygiene support. For example, those few that are still open are benefiting from secure stocks for those which are closed to ensure that they are fit for a return when lockdowns are lifted and students are able to return. Now, even as this virus continues to spread, we at UNICEF are thinking ahead to post pandemic responses. We've already launched communication campaigns at community level to encourage enrollment following this pandemic. We're already supporting programs to recover lost learning outcomes caused by the pandemic. We're looking at accelerated education, which allows for multiple pathways into formal education. And we're working with governments to support their education systems, and in particular, the rollout of system-wide solutions to address in particular the problem of missed examinations. That action that we have underway to address the immediate crisis involves our in-country teams supporting local response plans. And to date, we're working hard to support many millions of children, including through SMS and other communications channels, through Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. We're focusing on the rollout of free and open digital learning tools to support large scale remote learning, which is of course dependent on Wi-Fi and mobile data coverage and the availability of devices and on broadcast learning through partnerships with curriculum setters and TV and radio programmers, for example, in Rwanda, and print materials for use at home. We're providing teaching and instruction support to ensure that learning guidance is accessible for all children and educators, regardless of the medium being used. And we're also promoting the accessibility of learning tools and instructions, such as live sign language interpretation for those children with disabilities. Now, as part of our response to the pandemic, we are rapidly scaling up UNICEF's innovative learning passport, the pilot project for learning on the move. This digital education project includes research and an education model designed by Cambridge University here in the United Kingdom and a digital platform developed by Microsoft. The aim is to provide quality education content and technology to all children and youth, wherever they are, and in particular, to displace children. We recognize, however, that the continuity of learning requires strategy fit for context everywhere. Digital education will only ever be effective for those with the capacity to access these resources and the most vulnerable, the 17 million internally displaced and 12.2 million refugee children and the 1.1 million asylum seekers are at risk, frankly, of being left behind. It has been said that we're all in the same boat in this crisis, but the reality is that we're actually in the same crisis, but in very different boats, weathering it in different ways. Some frankly are in liners, some in ships, but many are in rafts. Many countries are incurring substantial unforeseen costs in pursuing distance learning, and in developing countries, these costs are stretching already wide gaps in financing in the education sector. With health being the overwhelming priority for the majority of donor countries, 
it's vital that educational needs don't slip down the agenda. Of the top 10 donors to education, eight have COVID response plans, and only five of those today include education in some way. Now, the World Bank has made 200 billion available to an initial 25 countries through a fast track initiative, but the country set to receive those funds, so far only Pakistan, has noted plans to use that allocated money towards education. A majority of COVID emergency funds from the regional development banks are also targeted to health and to technical support. This is, however, a recognition that action in regards to supporting education is urgently needed. And Yasmin and her team at Education Cannot Wait are already doing really outstanding work in allocating funds through its first emergency response, although it will ultimately lead to a shortfall in the fund's resources and the ability to respond to other emergencies. Now, UNICEF, in line with the WHO's strategic response plan and that interagency standing committee that I mentioned, have now revised our original appeal to $651.6 million to address the latest needs across the globe. I'm pleased to report that UNICEF has already received $50 million in donations thanks to generous contributions primarily from various governments and also from the private sector. However, with this fast moving pandemic, we require now more than ever flexible and timely funding so that these funds can be allocated quickly to where they're most needed as the situation of the pandemic evolves. We appeal directly therefore to governments, to business, to philanthropic organizations and to individuals to help step up and address this crisis. Frankly, it's worth recognizing, John, that this pandemic is a world changing moment. It's hard to overstate what we are all living through. It's history making and our response will be history shaping. How the international community responds to protect the educational future of children across the globe will be crucial, will be critical in deciding if the next generation comes out of this crisis strengthened or alas weakened. It is worth holding on to the fact, therefore, at this moment, that throughout history, pandemics and conflict have at times preceded genuinely progressive advances. As Anna Swanson highlighted in the Washington Post last month, the Black Plague back in the 14th century led to daughters being granted land rights for the first time. In the last century, the Great Depression, of course, led to the New Deal in the United States, and World War II led to the creation of the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, and indeed the Marshall Plan that brought so many benefits here in Europe. So I personally believe that there is actually an opportunity for us to come out of this pandemic with a renewed focus on how, as a global community, we can ensure that every child has the opportunity to learn and to realize their potential. It's worth remembering that we now have an entire generation that wherever they live and for however long they live, in the future we'll be able to look at each other and say, what happened to you at that moment of common jeopardy? Of course, the experience of lockdown is radically different in Manhattan than it is in Mumbai, than here in London or in Lagos. But nevertheless, today's children will share this shock and that jeopardy in common. And they will look at the international community and how we responded in that moment. That's why I believe that this pandemic for all of its terrible suffering prevents not only shared jeopardy, but also shared opportunity. A chance for the international community to come together and translate global goodwill into tangible action to tackle the huge inequalities that exist in the delivery of education. That is our shared opportunity. That is our shared duty at this moment. And working together, I believe that can be our shared achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, the Right Honourable Douglas um, Alexander. Your, your, your message is extremely powerful and very pertinent about our shared responsibility, our shared duty, and our shared need to take action. 
Without any further ado, I am now going to invite Yasmin Sharif, please, to share with us her insights and opening statement. Yasmin, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and um, first of all, thank you to, to you, Joel Hans from UNITAR, for, for bringing us together in the World Humanitarian Forum. It's my second year joining you, uh, last year in London, so I'm very excited to be back. I also would like to thank Douglas for a brilliant opening. Um, very pertinent, as you said, and, and, and very substantive. And um, I think also, I shouldn't say inspirational, but, but certainly thought provoking um, because it's really, really very much on target and it, it moves you. And to thank also Noella to be here with you. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a true pleasure and privilege to to join with you here today and look forward to meeting you in person as well. Now, education cannot wait, just very, for those who don't know, we are not as, we don't have the same famous brand as UNICEF, uh, but we are actually hosted by UNICEF. Uh, we are uh, a UN entity, uh, but we are an independent global fund uh, in the sense that we have our own governance board that is composed of uh, major development uh, donor partners, mayor, um, um, education ministers um, in countries that we serve, private sector, and uh, UN agencies, the heads of UN agencies, and not the least, the great civil society that makes up uh, the core of much of what we do, both in terms of advocacy and action on the ground. And we were created in, in, at the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul in 2016, uh, because there was a recognition that for all the great education efforts and investments that are being made, there are 75 million children, girls and boys, so the 9 million of them girls, in countries of armed conflict, natural disasters, or forced displacement uh, as refugees or internally displaced, who simply don't access a quality education despite all the investments made. And so, so and, and the founder, the, the driving force behind that was, was the, the chair of the higher level steering group of education cannot wait, um, uh, uh, Gordon Brown, who remains with us as our chair as of the day, and who is also the UN special envoy for global education. So it was a, it was a vision. We got to change this. We cannot, uh, we cannot leave the 75 million behind, but also recognition that the not sufficient funding was allocated to education in emergencies. Um, at that time, uh, about 2.4% out of the total allocations would go to education. And, and it does in no way match uh, the actual needs or how we would normally prioritize education. We were speaking about our children just before this, uh, nobody, put such a low priority on education for our own children if it's it for their household budget. And, and certainly we cannot allow that to happen to 75 million children in crisis and conflict. So part of our work as a global fund is to catalyze more resources for education in emergencies, use these resources to also leverage um, uh, and unlock additional resources, leverage uh, quality education, and certainly, certainly, as our name suggests, strengthen the speed, the speed of it. Uh, it cannot wait until the crisis is over. It has to happen now, or as Martin Luther King said, uh, the, the, the fierce urgency of the now. It's here and now. And there's a crisis, that's a trigger for action and should never be an excuse for delay. So that's how we came about the 75 million children. What we also bring into the broader global um, aid system um, in uh, emergencies is that we are a fund, we don't implement, we're a fund, and we bring together UN agencies and civil society and host governments and private sector to work together rather than competing and working in silos. So we, we work together and bring them together through joint programs where you can, where you, which have a twofold purpose or a threefold purpose. One is to get everyone to work together. 
which is a huge step forward, and which is also aligned with the UN reform of, of the new way of working. The other one is that you can bring humanitarian and development actors in the education sector together at the same time so that they actually design programs that address the immediate needs in the crisis, but also lay the building blocks for sustainability and systemic change at the same time. You don't wait, you do it all in parallel and mutually reinforcing. That's also new systemic change we bring. Now, the biggest challenges that we see um, as, as a crisis fund uh, and the challenges we see for our colleagues on the ground, um, the partners, the UN agencies, the civil society and the governments and the children above all, is that emergencies are abnormal environments. One cannot use the normal um, or, or the regular approach um, to a situation that is abnormal, chaotic, uh, absolute crisis. One has to be very creative and one has to be very um, uh, mindful of the situation on the ground and the voices of those we saw. Uh, we are speaking about active armed conflicts. Uh, just think about situations like Syria, where I think it might be abating right now. A situation like Libya, a situation like Afghanistan before the peace agreement which we all been hold. Um, Yemen, the active armed conflict, how, how do you deliver education in the midst of that? And often these conflicts have different parties. So you will have the jury government, and then you have the de facto government in, in Central African Republic, which is in conflict. I think you have 14 different militia groups, each of them controlling their territories, with children in, in all those ter different territories. Uh, take Iraq during the time of ISIL uh, in, in a place like Mosul, controlling that, that, that city for three years, and the education system, basically training children instead of learning to read and write and socioeconomic development and, uh, skills, teaching them how to kill. So, you know, these are, these are the main challenges. And then the displacement, we know that refugees and internally displaced, but refugees fleeing across an international boundary are those that are the most affected in terms of disrupted education. They, they don't have any roots. They, they, they don't belong or can access the, the, the public school system and, and, and often um, have to, to lean on aid organizations providing non-formal education, which is not sustainable in the long run. And then we have very, and this is, and I will come to COVID-19, but we also have the whole situation of, of and reality, the socioeconomic reality and the impact of very weak infrastructure. Uh, in, in the majority of these countries where we serve in crisis and displacement and conflict, uh, there is no access to internet and digital learning. 80% of, of Africa has no access to internet. So, so you know, innovative remote learning, digitalization, it, it, it can be taken for granted in, in a very few countries in that part of the world, uh, but it's not necessarily their reality. You live in a remote village in Afghanistan that don't even have electricity, um, and then uh, would, would never own a laptop. Uh, so it's very important to understand, and I think also Douglas mentioned that it's an important aspect. Um, so then, um, and, and then we have the, the, the ones that are the left borders behind, behind those left borders behind, and these are the girls. We have 39 million girls today, and probably that's going to double uh, once COVID-19 is over, uh, that do not access a quality education or any form of education, and, and instead are forced into early child marriages, uh, becoming part of the war economy, trafficking, sexual, uh, sexual violence, gender-based violence, and all of that is actually increasing during COVID-19 um, as a result of, of, of many factors that, 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 that put them at risk uh, and, and lacking in physical protection. Another, another uh, uh, dimension that is that that those children and the girls, and speak also about children with disabilities, by the way, 
because they, together with the refugees and the girls, are the ones that are going to suffer the most from COVID-19. And then we have the whole package that is so essential for a child or a young person to live through the trauma of a crisis, and that's mental health and psychosocial services. So, so, and then one could say that at least 99% would need it in various degrees, and that's also taken away from them. And so when it comes to the impact of COVID-19 is that by losing, by schools closing down, they're also losing the whole holistic package that comes with education besides uh, reading and writing and, 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 and of course the importance of, of social so, uh, social and emotional development, but also and development of art and science, but also the protection that comes with education to be in a safe learning environment uh, and losing the psychosocial services that often come, certainly in all education cannot wait investments, losing the school feeding, losing um, no access to water and sanitation and hygiene. And all of that is relevant to COVID-19, which is, is uh, you, you call it the double jeopardy. And we, we sometimes say uh, a crisis upon an already existing crisis. We're speaking about multiple crises here. How much can these children and young, young people bear uh, before we come around and actually do something? So that's, that is, that is um, um, I think these are the key issues now, what can, the, the, the international community do? Well, I would say the very first thing they need to do is to connect the dots. Whenever you don't connect dots, you, you're bound to fail. Everything is about connecting dots, to see the implications, see how different sectors are interrelated, what will be the consequences, to, to be able to look at the past and the present and be able to envisage what the future will look like. I mean, that's the basic if you want to be an efficient, productive, helpful uh, contributor. And, and in connecting the dots, it's important for the international community to see, yes, today, this is a health crisis, largely. It is a health crisis. Um, in, 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 the, in the 1940s, it was an armed conflict crisis. But every crisis means a disruption of the socioeconomic um, um, system and basic services. And none of these crises should give less attention to education, which is the very foundation for a society, not only to prevent this kind of, 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 of situations in the future and crisis, but also to sustain them learn from them and to rebuild after them. Without an educated population, you cannot prevent, you cannot rebuild, you cannot recover. So by connecting dots is for the international community to say, it is a health crisis, we are gonna put uh, uh, efforts to address health, but we can also do that through education because education is connected. Through the investments that education cannot wait, uh, uh, are making. And we have invested very fast in April, and we're doing a second round in June to 26 crisis countries. We, we, we totally released our entire uh, resource uh, to um, work um, which have been coordinated by the education cluster and also by refugee education working groups um, and funding that went to our colleagues, such as yeah. UNICEF, UNHR, World Food Program, Save the Children, Plan International and many local organizations, we, we released funding that would cater to education, which embedded awareness raising about COVID-19, sanitation, hygiene to protect themselves from COVID-19, um, the protection and that was taken away as a result of schools closing down, uh, schools used as hubs for water sanitation and protection, and mental health services that are in the higher demand even now because of uh, self-isolation. So once you see how it all interrelates, education is the overarching, and within that there are so many health-related uh, uh, dimensions. And if I were to choose, if I was an international donor, I will only invest in health, where I will invest in 
education, health, sanitation, protection, MHP and SAS at the same time. I get more for my money if I go that direction. And education is a wonderful bridge to that and, 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 and entry point. Uh, and what we need is more funding. You know, in Sweden, uh, it costs about $11,000 a year to educate a child. Um, we are expected to provide quality education in, this, um, in, in the most crisis affected countries on the globe with a budget of about $120 million per child. That's not quality education. So I think we, we, we I'm hoping to conclude that COVID-19 will keep us at home to the day we actually stop racing and start reflecting. To start reflecting on how we can actually emerge out of this crisis to create a better world with more socioeconomic equity, with less divides, where every country in the world has the infrastructure to access IT and technology, where every country in the world can prepare for another crisis like this, and it might have crisis like this, where every child's education matters uh, as much. Uh, and uh, this is our job to advocate for that and look forward to doing so together with all of the, the distinguished panel here and all the listeners and, and the audience and part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, very powerful um, and yet very important how you um, so succinctly unpacked exactly this um, as Alexander, uh, Douglas Alexander, um, described it, the double jeopardy and that, you know, we, 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 we are talking about 39 million girls and the, the impact of a crisis on yet existing crisis and just the complexity um, that exists. So thank you very much because that gives so much um, food for thought. And without any further ado, I, I now um, give the word to Noella who's going to um, do her introductory words. Thank you, Noella. I needed to unmute. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to share such an amazing panel with the uh, Deke Expector. Um, and congratulations, World Humanitarian Forum, to putting this panel together. I founded uh, Malaika in 2007 to give a voice to girls and their communities in the Congo. Before Malaika, in the village of Kalibuka, it was no access to electricity, clean water, or educational facilities. Over the 13 years that we've been working in this village, we've grown significantly. Our school curriculum is taught in both French and English. We provide a free primary and secondary education to nearly 350 girls, with subjects ranging from STEM, health, civic education, art, music. We provide a student to nutrition, uh, uh, nutrition meals a day, breakfast and lunch, using locally organic produce that we're producing in our farm. We also have a community center that offers um, health, sport, literacy program, as well as uh, 20 wells that we built over the 20 years. While Malaika touched the life of thousands of people each year, today's pandemic is making it harder for all of us, and especially for the people living in villages and not villages all over the world. The temporary closure of a school and community center is making it difficult to monitor the health of our students. And uh, I'm devastated that uh, last week we lost one of our students, Leia. She was 10 years old. And uh, since uh, two days, we have another student, Exodi. She's sick. She's uh, in emergency at the hospital. She's six years old. So what is very important is with uh, the schools in rural villages, we see that when students go to schools, it's a refuge, not only a refuge to learn, to have the nutrition program, but it's a refuge to that where we can see the health, if they're good, if they, if they need anything, and where we're providing to, to our girls sanitary pads, and we're talking about the sexuality too, because one of the points you say, the problem where their girls are out of school, a lot of them come back pregnant. 
So when you see the statistics that 50 million girls in sub-Saharan are out of schools, it's quite a, a, an alarming uh, statistic that we all need to work. And with this pandemic, we will be completely behind. And what we see with uh, in the village specifically that we're working, how the population all over Africa that, from, that live under one dollar a day will keep social distance. It's impossible for them. They need to take local transport. They need to go to sell the, the, the vegetables. They need selling their bricks, selling all, surviving on all the small jobs they're doing. And you, as we're seeing now so many closures, they cannot do that anymore. So when we're seeing the, the, the price of the food completely jumping, so a lot of families cannot afford to buy food right now. So at Malaika, we created an emergency fund where we feed over the last few weeks more than 1,500 people, where we, every Tuesday and Thursday, we're doing a programs where they can come to a school and we, or we go to some specific places and we're distributing food, necessity food, and we're distributing uh, soap and we create hygiene awareness. And for all the wells we have around the villages, we go really to explain the hygiene awareness, how to wash hands, how to keep social distance, uh, and how we can, uh, we can all work together to this crisis and really respect the rule of what the government asks to not gather, to not go to public places. And uh, through a community center, we've been uh, doing this week uh, more than 500 masks where we're distributing to the community. And we have some, uh, we have a 3D printer actually, and uh, we never make the most of the use of it. But this week we started to make uh, the shield mask. So we're going to produce um, to three to 400 shield masks. We're gonna donate to the, first of all, to our staff that's feeding and helping the, the villages. And we're going to donate them uh, to uh, some, uh, some uh, hospital. And it's really good because it's all locally made by uh, by amazing uh, by amazing uh, amazing talent what i'm seeing in all these situation we need a government especially in africa that they really have to improve ways that the population can have access food at a very good price where the population can have access to electricity to water water soap is a luxury where they can have um, where they can have access to mobile phone radios for education information a lot of them when you walk more and more further down in villages they don't have television they don't have electricity they don't have newspaper so they are completely isolated of what's happening worldwide in the world and they don't even understand that is an economical health crisis that will have so many effects not only for today but for for many years to 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 recover our government needs, yes, we totally agree, they close all the, 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 the public places, but they need to provide security. Because now I'm seeing um, in, the, in the province where I'm from, in Katanga and all over Congo, we're seeing a, a huge insecurity. So even us, to protect our school, our community center, we have to completely put more security to our, to our programs because people need to eat, people need to, 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 to survive. And we're going to see a lot of violence. We're going to see more rape, more mm. violence. And how we can have the, how can we all work with government and local NGO business leaders, corporate, how we can really try to calm down the population, how we can provide them more, more answer to the, the to the problems. And I, I think what bring the positive side of all this crisis, we think communities all over the world and individuals uh, coming coming um, coming together. But we will have a huge, 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 huge gap on education because so many languages. For instance, I speak about Congo. So many languages: French, uh, Swahili, Tiluba. So many languages. How are we gonna go through radio to to go to to, to uh, diversify and talk about the education or how we're gonna even give. Us even at the school, we're not allowed to give the, the, the homeschool and uh, the, the homework, the, the student cannot come to a school even to get them. So we had to create a group of volunteers and mothers to go through the villages and have some points where they can give to, to the students. For a local staff, the teacher, it's very hard to come to a school too because they need to take local transport they need um, they don't have all access and we've seen a lot of schools uh, all over africa because of this crisis 
they don't pay the teachers, they don't pay the staff, they can afford. Even us now as a foundation, we've been hit very heavily by donations, but our priority number one is to still keep our, uh, keep our staff. So we make sure that our staff every month are paid, that we're putting emphasis still in the training teachers in this period. But it's, uh, it's hard because yes, uh, if you, you cannot afford to pay the teachers, that's one thing, but the problem, how are you gonna find these passionate teachers, these passionate staff to come back to your school? We put for uh, the last 10 years so much emphasis in our, uh, in our staff and in the, in the training, so it's impossible for us. And we want to make sure that they are fine and uh, the, the family is, uh, is fine too. And that's what the government need to do to make sure that all the employees, the more than six, I was reading a report on global partnership education and more than 62 million uh, teachers are affected worldwide. And we have to make sure that these teachers will play a crucial time, crucial um, role when everything coming back to normal, but a crucial role too now. And we need to look after them and ensure the salaries and um, the mental health uh, are one um, uh, moment for now. So that will be my, my key point. Thank you so much, Noella. I, you know, your contribution just um, illustrates that just how very personal this crisis is for for so many people um, and and the social fabric of uh, of of um, our society. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I just want to add one more thing. And the problem is, we're talking about the virus, but we have to take in consideration that a lot of countries in Africa, the rainy season just finishing in, in, in a few weeks. So we are in a crisis still where malaria hit a lot of children and families like Leia, she died of malaria. So we really have to emphasize how we can prevent the virus of COVID-19, but how we can still prevent all the other illness. Thank you very much for that, Noella. Um, time is uh, running against us. Um, so I would kindly, um, now suggest that we um, we try to um, answer some of the question that uh, some of the um, participants who are joining us. Thank you very much for sending us your questions. So um, the right honourable Douglas Alexander, if I can ask you the first question, you know, if you can ask just the panelists to, to make as brief as possible. Um, so, what lessons from previous crises? are informing the education responses now during COVID-19? Um, I'll be brief and thank you for your direction to us to be brief. L let me make the general point and then the specific. The general point is often what works and is appropriate in the pre-crisis world is not appropriate in the teeth of the crisis. So let me give you an example. Uh, we in UNICEF are great supporters of online education, but exactly as Yasmin acknowledged, there are many environments in where that's a very difficult um, task to deliver given the absence of either hardware, bandwidth, or the technologies. So take a country like Rwanda. There are about 3 million children out of school in Rwanda at the moment. We've gone back to a technology really from the beginning of the last century, radio communication. And as UNICEF, we've provided a hundred different educational scripts that are being used by Rwandan radio to teach children in circumstances where physically they cannot gather and online learning is not for them an option. So I actually think that we need imagination and agility in response to the crisis. Some of the best crisis response we've seen historically has understood very quickly how much the crisis changes the context in which global public goods like education are being delivered. And it seems to me our challenge is to recognize the extent to which the context has changed and so must therefore our response. Thank you so much. And um, Yasmin, so what are the lessons that we've learned so far from the responses that you are seeing now coming from governments in terms of lessons that we're going to be implementing and lessons learned? You need to unmute yourself, Yasmin. Sorry, when you say lessons learned from governments, you mean uh, the international community or governments? Okay. Well, the international community, the, 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 the lesson learned, we, we um, 
we see a decline in funding um, towards education, including amongst donors who were um, deliberately committing themselves to strengthen education in emergencies and crisis. So suddenly you're hit by crisis and all those commitments, you know, they, they are put on the, you know, on the shelf because now we have to deal with a different crisis. And, and so I think that the lesson learned is that if you want to achieve a goal, and here with, let's say the sustainable development goal four, but it would apply to all global goals. If you want to achieve that, you've got to stand firm by your commitment. When you have, you make a commitment to take certain priorities in a crisis, and then the crisis hits or exacerbates, and suddenly it's not the priority anymore. You, you don't achieve any visions or goals by shifting your, your priorities left and right. Um, so we need firmer leadership, more principled leadership. Once you make a commitment, you stand the ground all the way. Um, and I can say that there are some governments that are really doing that. And I'm not saying that just because uh, uh, Douglas Alexander is a Brit and my boss is a Brit, but the UK has really stood the ground. They made a commitment to education in emergencies and they were the first to come forward to fund us in our COVID-19 appeal. This is a very important leadership model. Another one is labor um, as a private sector. Of all the private sector companies out there, they came in and invested 25 million like this and saying, now, it's now, it's not next year, it's not in six months. So they are both from a government side and from a private sector side showing that it's now that we should be acting. Back to the fierce urgency of now. So that's the lesson learned. Uh, and I think there are broader lessons to draw from that. But if you want to make the world a better place, it's not enough to have a vision. It's not even enough to make a commitment. You have to walk the talk and you have to do it all the way. And we are hoping that governments and private, private sectors will follow the model and the shining examples of, of uh, the, the governments who have contributed in private sector and uh, increase the resources uh, towards education and the, and the multiple sectors uh, such as health, water and sanitation, uh, protection, MHP assessment and health can be addressed simultaneously and part of a holistic uh, quality uh, learning package. And then again, hoping that this might trigger us all to invest more in long-term development infrastructure and a fairer society, global society, so that the next time we have a virus, everyone has access um, on the same terms to uh, creative, innovative, digital uh, uh, um, uh, tools uh, to keep up with education because education is one sustainable development goal we cannot compromise on because without that, all other sustainable development goals will fall. You cannot reduce poverty without education. You cannot achieve gender equality without education and you cannot have good governance and peace and justice without education. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to use this opportunity to invite Noella to please make her um, concluding comments. The, the, I think um, a lot of has been said and everything has been said, <laughs> but I do think uh, we still need to keep the conversation going. I do think in England, maybe in June, they will start to reopen bit by bit. I'm mad, myself a mother of two children, so I do homeschool every day. And it's, I admire teachers, they are my heroes, definitely. I do think we need to put a system, uh, all, all of us, we need to work together to put a system to be ready when when school will reopen, because I think it will be a lot of disparity in the learning. You will have some children will come back very uh, high learner because they will have done all their homeschool. They will have, uh, the parents will even push more on them. Some parents cannot, they have full-time jobs and they cannot really spend so much time with kids. So some of them will come back more lower. We need to find a way for uh, underprivileged uh, areas all over the world. How we gonna do? How we gonna in, increase 
maybe we have to open in the summer the some schools. I do think that will be one of the solution because I don't see in the calendar, for instance, in Africa, school finish the 30th of June or the 1st of July. We have no idea in Africa when school will reopen. They didn't an did any announcement. A lot of children won't have at all any homeschooling because of they don't have internet, they don't have mobile phone and etc. How are we gonna close this gap in terms of education? And we're gonna make sure that as uh, the student will come back safe and we have to make sure that uh, that the security has to be in place and girls uh, we see a lot of problems of um, of on the girls education too because we did a survey a little bit with our student uh, uh, why what they're missing the most at home and they're missing they, uh, they're missing to be safe they're missing, uh, they have to work a lot and they, at their house, look after the kids, uh, look after the brothers and the sisters. How we can make sure that, and to make sure that the teachers too didn't lose the system of teaching because to be two or three months out of school, how are you gonna go back to work in a stressing environment? Because you're gonna be confronted to 30 or 50 or 100 kids in your classroom and you need to be back to normal to teach them, to have the patience and to understand what is the level of each student? So I think we have a lot of work and it needs to be, it cannot be said we're gonna open the school in one month, in two months in Africa or in Brazil or wherever. We need to have a plan in place and to study each country all over the world, how we can strengthen every educational system with the teachers, with the communities and with the students and create a student committee where they can say to what's, what they're thinking because they are the best to know what they learn and what they're missing. Thank you so much, Noella. Yasmin, your concluding comments, please. You need to unmute yourself. I would like to encourage uh, all participants at the World uh, Humanitarian Forum session today uh, to go out, advocate, speak up, whether you're a civil society, whether you're a government official, you're an academic, uh, you're a UN um, uh, actor, but we do need to speak up for education. And, and, and I think we live in an era where our voices do matter and are more um, uh, urgent and important than ever. We need to speak up for those whose voice is not yet heard uh, because of the situation on the ground and the remote areas where they are. But if you give them a good education, you bet their voices will echo around the globe one day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And, and the last word to the right, Honourable Douglas Alexander, please. Thank you, Jan, and thank you again, both for your chairing and for the facilitation of today's important discussion by the World Humanitarian Forum. Let me just offer two concluding thoughts. I have had the great privilege of not simply working with UNICEF now in recent years, but previously serving in government as the Secretary of State for International Development here in the United Kingdom, the British Governor to the World Bank, and to travel extensively and to work in a whole range of countries in the service of that work in development. I learned many things over those decades, but probably my single biggest learning was that the greatest investment you can make in a country's future is education, and in particular, the education of women and girls. And I think it is important that amidst this great and profound challenge, we don't lose sight of that lodestar, that there is a great deal resting on the continued education of women and girls and of young people more generally. The second point I will make will be here in the United Kingdom, there has been a lot of discussion of the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 and 1919. At the end of the First World War here in Britain, given the horror and the suffering of the trenches, the cry went up that we needed to build a land fit for heroes. I genuinely believe that after this pandemic, our challenge should be to build a world fit for our children and for our grandchildren. And if we are to fulfill that promise, then education must be at the center of building back better. So to everybody on this call, I would urge a continued engagement, step in, don't step back in the face of this crisis. And then after this crisis, work with us to shape the post-crisis common sense. And at the heart of that common sense is the insight that education is not only the best investment in healthcare and governance, 
it is also fundamental to the liberation of human potential. And in that sense, we have much work to do. And today's conversation, I hope, has stimulated and inspired people to recommit themselves to that vital task. Thank you so much. Um, and, and allow me just to wrap up our session. And I would like to address the participants today to say thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to our um, panelists and to the participants, I wish to express a most sincere and profound thank you for your insight. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your leadership. But most importantly, thank you for you um, your humanity. This crisis we have seen is very personal. It is all about this dialogue about our shared human experience. And to go back to the mission of the World Humanitarian Forum, they remind us we are in this together and our collective mission is more relevant than ever in creating these purposeful partnership in inclusive networks to ensure that we leave no one behind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. See you very soon.